going to welcome you to this um, evening's webinar where we're going to uh, try and encourage as many of you as possible to think about a career in medical oncology and uh, try and give you some uh, some hints and tips from a, a panel of, uh, of us who are involved. Um, um, so as I said, uh, welcome. This is our agenda for the evening. Um, I've got a, there's a panel of us uh, sitting here. We've got uh, three of uh, our trainees from different uh, different centres, Ella, Jenny and Richard, are going to be giving us presentations and helping with questions later on. Uh, we've got Satinda, who is our new chair of the Special Advocate Specialist Training Committee, uh, and myself, uh, Simon, as the uh, National Clinical Recruitment Lead. So hopefully we'll be able to cover some different perspectives and get through uh, any of your questions uh, later on. Thanks, Richard. Next slide. Uh, so I think we've done that bit. And I think the only thing I was going to do before letting everyone else speak was just put up this slide from the, um, the ACP, the Association of Cancer Physicians, summarising uh, what a medical oncologist does. And there's this uh, this information is on the on the website as well. But essentially, to set the scene, we're, we're responsible for looking after patients with cancer and discussing therapeutic options, um, looking after systemic therapy treatments, and then supporting patients through the, that, the, their journey of care. I think the key points we're going to want to get over is, as hopefully you know, patients are living longer and treatments are becoming more complex. And so the, the speciality is dynamic and changing fast. Uh, and that's part of the, the joy of working in the area. Um, and that most of the consultants in their jobs will specialize in two or three different types of cancer within their job plan. Uh, as well as being involved in um, looking after patients uh, with cancer, complications of cancer and their treatment uh, under what, what we call acute oncology. And then I think the guys will be going through uh, what a sort of training in medical oncology looks like. But within the, the training, we try and make sure that you get the opportunity to cover all the major areas, uh, including all the new fields, such as the sort of development of immunotherapy, um, so that by the end, you're uh, sort of completely trained to, to be ready for your start as a consultant and, and learn some more. So I think um, that's my introductory slide. I think, Richard, if we would put up, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Satinder Jagdev, who's uh, a consultant medical oncologist and obviously, as I said, chair of the SAC, and he's going to give us a consultant perspective uh, talk over the next 10 minutes or so. Thanks, Satinder. Thanks very much, Simon, and welcome, everyone. Really uh, great to be speaking to you all today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the consultant perspective on a career in medical oncology. I've been a medical oncologist for 14 years at the, Leed Cancer, at the Leeds Cancer Centre and, um, and, um, and, and generally have, um, have found it to be a very fulfilling and rewarding um, consultant life to, to have been involved in. So next slide, please. So you've just heard about what medical oncology is. So, so it's really um, taking taking those um, developments of um, systemic therapy into the clinical setting and treating and managing patients with a, a cancer diagnosis with systemic therapies. And so, why medical oncology? Why should you apply for this particular? career path. So these are some of the things that, that really have, um, have, attra have attracted me to the specialty and that I've really enjoyed about it. So first and foremost, it's very patient centred. So um, as Simon has just said, it's a developing and evolving specialty. Things are very part fast paced, but we keep in mind what is the need of the patient that we have in front of us. And um, we have a very holistic view of the whole journey of the patient we're involved in MDT as you'll hear um, in a minute, uh, which look at the diagnosis um, of, the, of, of the cancer, the stage that they're at, and we take them through the different stages of their journey up until the, the point at which perhaps we don't have anything else to offer and we're then liaising with our colleagues in the community and in palliative care. So also no two cancers are the same. So the complexities of, of cancer diagnosis are really fascinating. So the course that a particular cancer in the lung may take, for example, will be different to, to a colorectal cancer, to a urological cancer. And that makes for a very, very varied and interesting field. And as Richard has, has just said, most of us will 
um, specialize in um, a few cancer types that that we um, that we look after, um, and so that's a really a, a attractive part of the specialty that it's varied and there there is lots going on, and certainly it's it uses the cutting edge of of research, um, which is directed. Um, into, into patient care and certainly we find that our practice changes on perhaps a six monthly basis so I look after patients with urological cancers so kidney cancer blood cancer prostate cancer and the um, there are new agents coming through and new ways to use our agents new scientific um, information coming through about uh, biomarkers and which patients will benefit from particular treatments all the time and so we're having to evolve with that and keep up to date and that makes for a very dynamic um, working life. There's very much a team approach so medical oncology is a team sport we don't work in isolation we work with our clinical oncology colleagues we work with the surgeons pathologists radiologists um, and uh, and and uh, and it was just within the clinic also with our clinical nurse specialist colleagues pharmacy and the allied professions so it really the it really is done as a team approach and again that is um it is something that could be incredibly beneficial for the patients and then there are plenty of directions that you can take your career into and we'll talk about that in just a minute uh, but lots and lots of opportunities to pursue different interests and to bring other varied aspects into your consultant career and again a range of settings to work in and certainly excellent regional um, national and international networks um, as a medical oncologist so we have local tumor groups and um, and uh, cancer networks we collaborate with with other centers uh, we have national um, associations for the tumor types and for our specialty so the association of cancer physicians is an excellent um, example of that and of course there are international networks of colleagues as well next slide please Richard Thank you. So these are the different directions that your career as a medical oncologist could take. So um, for those who have a strong academic interest and uh, background, the, there is the um, option um, to look at clinical academic careers. And, and I'm sure the, the trainees will be touching on what that looks like as a trainee, but also as a, cons as a consultant leading a research group um, or working with research groups, working in trial development, etc on an academic pathway. So I'm an NHS medical oncologist, and um, but even within my uh, NHS remit, I am involved in um, clinical trials, education, teaching. So um, there is there is lots on top of the, the NHS clinical work to, to be involved in. And the... Uh, there is the opportunity to look at service development, look at how to how to better your services for your patients and also go down the clinical management route, as well as teaching and education. And again, that's something that I've been involved in for, for many years now. And there, as I've just mentioned, there are a range of settings that you um, could potentially work in. So the cancer set centres uh, deal with um, the, the common cancers, but also some of the um, intermediate and some of the rarer cancers as well. So there's there are opportunities to work in very specialist roles there. But there, there are also uh, the opportunities to work in the district general hospitals to provide that cancer care for patients locally and closely closer to them so that it makes it very accessible uh, to where they are. So a range of settings depending on again the type of setting that you like to work in. Thanks Richard. Next slide. So this slide is just really an overview of what is life like as a medical oncologist and um, what do we get involved in, what does our timetable look like, what and, and what do we do as our 
for bread and butter. So um, we work with the MDTs, as I've mentioned. So um, this is looking at the diagnosis, of, new diagnosis of cancer and referrals in from other specialties or from the GPs. It's a multi-specialty environment where we are liaising with our colleagues as to which is the best route for this patient to take in terms of their next step, step in management, whether that's cancer surgery, whether that's systemic therapy, radiotherapy, etc. And all cases are reviewed on an individual basis. Um, the bulk of our work is done in the outpatient clinic. And as IMT uh, trainees, you may not necessarily um, have too much of a flavour for that um, and hopefully you will have the opportunity to get to some outpatient clinics because the the patients that you see as an inpatient obviously those are the ones that are very unwell with their complications of their cancer and the complications of their treatment but there is another side of it and that is the well patients that we look after that are on treatment and on follow-up and um, and again those patients that come in on, on clinical trials and um, this is where we really get to make some of those complex management decisions that will influence what happens to the patient and then of course the the inpatient work um, and the acute work with on call and acute oncology so we are um, we do our on call specifically for um, oncology and um, not uh, general internal medicine and I know there are some questions on that later on and acute oncology itself is the our services take on some of the acute work that um, comes through uh, to look after our cancer patients in that setting and then um, again opportunities to get in, involved in, in research clinical trials um, and education and training thank you next slide So the, um, obviously there are going to be some, some choices that you're going to need to make in terms of whether you're interested in a career in oncology or whether there are other, um, other specialties that you're interested in. And, um, and I just put together this slide really just with some questions to ask yourself uh, about, you know, what, are you, what do you want from a career? Because once you're on, you know, you're, doing your training and you're going into your consultant life that is that that, that there's that there's a long time that you're going to be spending there so I think asking yourself what do you enjoy what do you enjoy about being a doctor what do you enjoy about your job is really important and certainly if you want a career that is very patient-centered that is that is um you enjoy communicating with the with the patients and their carers and your colleagues and really tackling some difficult challenging sensitive issues then you know this is a fantastic specialty for that you know do you enjoy working in a team um, and complex problem solving um, and and also applying the cutting edge of research to your to your um, clinical uh, life what are your strengths so what is it that you're good at what is it that you that, that you particular that particularly stands out to you that you that that you feel that you would like to grow and to develop and think about the the specialties that you've been in and the ones that you're looking at to say well you know are these playing to my strengths my individual strengths um who are my people so i think that's really important um, I think it's really important to look at the people around you in a, in a specialty and say, well, are there role models here that that I, you know, want to want want to um, be like or look after or, or or sort of, you know, imbibe some of those qualities into my practice and 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 how I work. And um, who who are the people that are my like-minded people? Um, and and again, when you have experience in the different um, specialties that'll give you an idea and certainly if there are no role models in the post that you're in perhaps that is not the specialty for you I think that's important to think about and then how can I get a taster how can you actually get some experience um, have some clinic experience specifically to be able to get the balance balanced view particularly in in oncology where the inpatients as i say are very unwell but you don't get the the other side of the equation and really approaching 
um, friendly people in that specialty and um, your consultants you, uh, approaching the training program directors and educational supervisors to say, can I come along to clinics? Can I um, you know, see how treatments are done? Can I get some experience in this specialty? Um, and all of that is uh, very helpful and useful when, you, when you're thinking about your decisions. Next slide. So I wish you all the very best in your um, applications. I hope this, this, this uh, talk has been useful for you. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll pick up on some questions later on. Thank you. Brilliant. So Tenda, thank you ever so much. That's uh, a lovely overview. And uh, I think we'll give a perfect segue now if we go on to, um, to Ella and uh, Richard, who are gonna give us a, a perspective from the trainee, trainee side, if that's okay. So Ella, over to you, thank you. Hi everyone and welcome. My name's Ella. Um, as Dr. Pacey said, and I'm a trainee in seven. I'm currently on maternity leave, but I am halfway through SD4. Uh, so just to start, I thought I would give a, a, a basic overview of, of training. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this diagram. Um, just go back a slide, Richard. Great. OK, so obviously many of you will be have completed F1 and F2 and, and possibly in internal medicine training at the moment. Um, both clinical and medical oncology, you apply for uh, these specialties during IMT2 with a view to starting an ST3. So they're group two specialties, meaning that you don't have to complete IMT3. Um, both specialties undergo the oncology common STEM year, which is where you gain experience in both radiotherapy and systemic treatments, as well as acute oncology. And then beyond that, medical oncology is a further three years of training, so four years in total. Clinical oncology is slightly different and is five years in total, so four years after the oncology common STEM year. And medical oncologists come under the remit of the JRC PTB. So in terms of exams, we just have one specialty certificate examination, which you can take any time in training, but most people attempt it around ST4, ST5. And that's just a, an, an MCQ style 200 question paper, not dissimilar to MRCP part one and part two. Clinical oncology, just to highlight the difference, they have separate exams. They have exams at the beginning and the end of their training under the Royal College of Radiologists. They're under a different Royal College. Next slide, please. I just wanted to talk a little bit about my route into medical oncology because I didn't know that I wanted to do oncology until quite late. And I also wasn't particularly academic. And I think there's a common misconception that to be a medical oncologist, you have to have lots of experience in research. And that's that's not the case. So the picture in the top left is a picture of Cornwall. I went to Peninsula and graduated in 2015. I did undergraduate medicine. I had no previous degrees and I didn't intercalate. So I don't have any other degrees other than my medical degree. I then went on to do F1, 2 and CMT in London, which was great. And I realised uh, early on in core medical training that I really liked oncology. I did do an oncology job, but you don't necessarily have to do an oncology job to be to pursue a career in oncology. So you can demonstrate interest and gain experience other ways. So, for example, during a respiratory job, I uh, did a lung cancer themed project. And during a HIV job, I, I helped with a HIV oncology themed project. So. Um, it's not necessary to have an oncology rotation if, if, if you're not given one. After this, I decided to take some time out of training. So I traveled for a bit and then I took up a post as an oncology registrar, a non-training grade registrar in Australia, a medical oncology registrar at Central Coast Cancer Center. And I did that for a year, which was fantastic. And I then traveled a bit more and came home uh, last year before last, two years ago now, in 2021, to start ST3 in the Seven Deanery. And that's a lovely picture of Bristol, where I am now. Next slide, please, Richard. I thought I would just talk a little bit about a, a typical week for a medical oncology registrar. Now, just to highlight, this will be very different depending on where you are and what tumour sites you're doing. But just for, I guess, a, a bit of a flavour, I'll, I'll talk you through a typical week for me prior to maternity leave. So my tumour sites were urology and germ cell. Typically, you'll have between one and three tumour sites and you rotate every four to six months. Um, Mondays, I would have time to see uh, my any inpatients under, uh, under uh, my consultant's care. And I also had time for admin, quality improvement, research and education. Um, I'm doing a master's in genomic medicine funded by HEE. So Mondays, I would usually use a bit of my time to work on my master's. And I would also prep for clinic the following day, look at all the new patients um, to try and gain some background about the histopathology, the radiology. And perhaps if I, were, if I didn't know what treatment I would be offering them, um, I would do some reading around key clinical trials in that tumor site. 
So Tuesday, as I've alluded to, all day clinic, mix of telephone and in-person consultations and a mix of new and follow up patients, um, usually under the supervision of, of a consultant, um, although seeing patients independently as well. On Wednesday mornings, I would work with the acute oncology service, which was a nurse led, a CNS led team that go and see patients admitted under the care of other specialties in the hospital. And I would um, help them kind of troubleshoot off a, a medical opinion. The afternoon would, was MDT. Thursday, I had cancer of unknown primary MDT, which is a short meeting, as well as some time to do clinical trials. So um, perhaps see patients on trials, but also various uh, signings of, of forms and completing paperwork. Thursday afternoon, some more time for um, personal development uh, and admin and seeing inpatients. Friday, germ cell MDT followed by clinic and Friday afternoon was largely catching up on admin and uh, we, we would have a weekly regional registrar teaching, which lasted around an hour. In terms of on-call commitments, in addition, we do, uh, in my job currently, we do non-resident night shifts from 5 p.m. till 9 a.m. where we're at home but fielding calls uh, potentially from A&E or from the SHO on call for the oncology ward. Uh, roughly around one in six weekends and weeks where you're taking off all of your normal duties and you're the registrar on call for the ward, but also taking referrals, perhaps seeing anybody that's unwell in the chemotherapy unit. Uh, on call will vary significantly dep depending on which deanery and which hospital you work at. So there are still some deaneries where you would do resident night shifts. So just to flag, this is my experience and it is quite different from, from place to place. Next slide, please. Um, so Tinder's already covered this beautifully, but a, a few reasons why I really love medical oncology and would recommend it to everyone. So first and foremost, the, the patient interactions, you're really able to build relationships. You know, potentially these patients will be under your care for a long time. There are if, even patients with metastatic disease in, in some tumour types, there are, there are multiple lines of therapy. So almost a bit like GP, you're able to really build relationships and get to know people. You can also make a huge impact. We do we do cure people. And also uh, in those patients who we can't cure, you're able to make an impact by potentially offering them a longer life and better quality of life with treatment. And I really value the um, communication and, and the challenging conversations. I think it's quite a privilege to, to be able to go into difficult communication scenarios and do them well. We've touched on MDT working already, but just to highlight, you really do work with a broad range of specialties and allied health professionals. I enjoy the acute oncology side of things. You see a huge variety in presentations, both cancer related and treatment related. So general medical skills are, are, are very important. We're trying to keep these patients away from the acute medical take and, and under the oncology services. Therefore, you need to be able to know how to manage a whole host of conditions. And I like the uh, balance between the acute work, which is quite fast paced, uh, perhaps a bit more stressful with the outpatient work, which, which is a, a really different style of working. There's lots of educational opportunities and I'll come on to that in a moment. Research is something that I enjoy, but I think long gone are the days where to be a medical oncologist, you absolutely have to do an MD or a PhD. Um, if you are interested in research, by all means, there's out of programme opportunities to do those things. Um, but if that's not for you, then that's OK as well. Um, it, just to highlight, most medical oncologists will obviously see patients on clinical trials, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to spend three years doing a PhD unless you're interested in it. And also work-life balance. I think my on-call rotor isn't too bad. I, I finish on time most of the time. I, I'm able to spend a lot of time at home and, and get back to my family, which is important to me. Next slide, please, Richard. Just to touch a bit more on educational opportunities, I think this is one of the um, fantastic things about oncology is there is never uh, any shortage of things to use your study leave on. Uh, there's we have locally, we have regional teaching, super regional teaching days. During the ST3 Oncology Common STEM year, you're encouraged to attend a, a biological basis of cancer course. I attended the Christie course, but there's others available. Um, various centres like the Marsden and the Christie often run tumour site specific days. Um, ESMO, the European Society of Medical Oncology, for which is a very small fee to join as a trainee, run preceptorships, which are two day crash courses in tumour sites in various locations across Europe. I did the breast preceptorship in Belgium last year, and these are fully funded by ESMO, the hotel and the course. And I got a travel grant from ESMO, as do a lot of people that I think apply. So it was a completely free educational opportunity. 
the Association of Cancer Physicians. So uh, both Richard, uh, Jenny and I are all on the committee for the ACP and we offer monthly educational webinar series as well as the annual trainings weekend away, which is fully funded with the ACP membership, which is £50 a year for registrars. And that's two days of education um, plus a lot of fun on the Saturday night, including a ball. Um, industry events, so working closely with, with pharmaceutical companies, uh, they often offer educational days with updates on key clinical trials and also conferences where you can have the opportunity to, to present if, you, if you've done a project or some research. Uh, I, next slide, please. I think that's it for me. So I'll hand over to Richard for, for a bit from his perspective. Thanks, everyone. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Ella. Um, if you just give me a thumbs up, you can hear me because I had some problems. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to add a little bit onto what Ella's already talked about, but I won't take up too much time because I think it'd be useful to get to the Q&A session. Um, so I'm a, a ST4 in Yorkshire. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background of my training, just to sort of illustrate that there is a, a wide variety of ways to get through through this. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree and then I did do a in my university a, an integrated MBPhD programme, but that's pretty unusual way of going around things so most people don't do that and if they want to do research they do it when they're a registrar um, so that got me through to 2015 so I was at university for quite a long time um, and then I did all my junior jobs down in the Oxford Deanery. Um, I also decided like Ella that after F2 I wanted to go and experience life somewhere else and so I went to Australia for a year um, and as you can see I just thought I'd put a little picture up there of, of me on my 30th birthday on Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, I then came back to England um, up to Leeds and, and Yorkshire is a fantastic place to come and live and, and study and work if you want to. Um, so I did my core medical training and obviously COVID hit towards the end of that, which, which affected lots of things. Um, I applied for medical oncology in 2020 and I was unsuccessful in my first application. And I think that's really important to realise that even if you don't succeed with your first application, you can still get some more experience. So I just, I applied then for a clinical fellow job at, at the Christie working in melanoma. Um, and I, that in hindsight was actually the best thing that could have happened because I got a lot more experience as working effectively as a registrar. Um, and that also made it much easier when it came to applications. Um, so I applied for a second time and thankfully this time was successful um, in working in Leeds. Um, so I also decided about six months into being a registrar that I wanted to work less than full-time because I have a two-year-old daughter and I want to spend more time with her um, and I think as Ella alluded to that's a really important part of of your work-life balance and I've just put a little picture of her being a bit crazy there um, and I'm currently ST4 moving on to ST5 and as you can see I've got the ski exam next week which is taking up a lot of time at the moment um, so that's just how my background so obviously very different but Think lots of different ways into getting into training um, and I think just those are the things I'd like to just sort of tell people is you know there's no right way of getting into training it's individual to you and I think the key is just at every stage identifying you know, doing what you think feels right and what's best and what might give you the best opportunities um, there is a lot of chances to do research I have done some but as you can see since my PhD I've not really done any research since then and at the moment I'm well, less than full-time but when I'm doing it, I'm full-time clinical. Um, and there are increasing numbers of less than full-time trainees. So if you do feel that you want to be a less than full-time, oncology is perfectly set up for that. And lots of people do take advantage of it. Um, I thought I'd also just do a little bit about um, advice for applications and interviews. Um, so as, as Dr. Uh, Jagdev and Ella have alluded to, um, that we do want to see the, the interviewers do want to see some commitment to the specialty, but that doesn't mean you have to have done really extensive amounts of oncology. I think they're just looking for evidence that during your jobs, you've done things to, to show that you like oncology, that you want to do it. So taste the days, um, as Ella did, even in other specialties, there are lots of things that are related to cancer that you can do as projects or quality improvement or audit. Um, and it's worth trying to get to see outpatient oncology just because it's so much different to the inpatient work you might have done as SHO. So if you feel like you've done an oncology SHO job and you've put off by oncology from that, don't let that put you off because it's a much different experience down in outpatients. Um, the, the interviews do have set their stations on research and academia, but that's a lot about is your understanding of research rather than necessarily 
research you've done yourself. So just knowing how research is performed is useful. Um, and one of the stations in the interview is about clinical aspects. So making sure that you know about the, the clinical aspects of oncology and how you manage patients is really important. Um, we will send a link around after the webinar about some links to the application pages, just so you can get some more information about it there. Um, so that's a, just a brief thing for me. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, so what we'll do now is um, we'll go to a panel discussion and we can obviously have questions through the chat function, but we also have some pre-submitted questions that we can try and go through because there were some common themes that people submitted beforehand. So I'll move on to that. Um, so Dr. Casey, I don't know if you want to take the lead for this and we can obviously ask any question, you ask anyone you think is appropriate to answer the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Richard. Um, I can just see the title at the moment. Have you got the, the next slide? Brilliant. Um, so Tinder, I, I'm, shall I, I'll, I'll crack on and, and we can mm -hmm. double act if that's all right. Apologies, everyone. We, we haven't rehearsed this because they've obviously only come in. So um, you, you don't have to, at the current the current time, the rules keep changing. You don't have to have passed places to apply. You have to be able to show that you will have it by the time you take up your appointment. But again, keep an eye on the JRCP TV website and they will um, tell you that the current things as that changes. Obviously, there was, a, there was a derogation during COVID. Thanks, Richard. I think, as I understand it, that now it's back to you do have to have, have passed places to be able to start an oncology training job. Is that right? Uh, that's Satinda's, Satinda's nodding and that may they may mm. have changed it um, yes. so that was the plan I just wasn't sure that it happened for round two <laughs> I think we've probably covered that one Satinda haven't we about PhDs do you want to yeah so so absolutely I think do you uh, do you need to have research or a PhD to qualify for medical oncology training or consultancy post? Certainly not for training. And um, and for consultant posts, again, um, it, it depends obviously on the career path that you want to, to follow. But I think what what it's important to say is that that we are very supportive in medical oncology of, of people taking some time out to do something so if they if they want to do some research and that is what they're leading up to then that that is very much supported but our trainees also take up a year to do a leadership fellow um, post, for example, or an education fellow, or do a standalone clinical fellow post that gives them some uh, experience in research or a particular type of of, um, of specialist area of cancer. So, so I think um, no, you don't necessarily need it, but some, you know, it, we we very much support people taking time out of their program to do something that enriches their experience, but also their, um, you know, their applications when it comes to consultant posts. Don't know if you wanted to add to that, Simon. No, I think that I think that's perfect. I think the the point that the guys made is is right. It, the days where everyone has to have a, a PhD and and ninety five percent of people did a higher degree are behind us it, it's a fantastic thing to do if it supports your career and the, i think people who do it usually get quite a lot out of doing it but it, it, it's individual um but we're very supportive and, and there's lots of opportunities there was a question in the uh, q a that sort of linked in to what you've just been discussing there about phds and timeouts asking about how how practical is is it to think about a phd alongside training and um, just to add to what's already been said, in terms of out of program opportunities, you can take uh, time out of program to do various different things, and they include doing research. Um, obviously, by the time you get to uh, doing a PhD, for example, you'd want to have done some preparation work um, alongside your training in, in order to um, sort of start um, as you leave out of programme but you will be supported in that and um, there's lots of opportunities um, where you, probably where you work or if not then uh, asking around the country of different uh, PhD opportunities coming up and 
as well as doing out of program for research, you can do out of program for these other things that Dr. Jagdev has already listed in terms of fellowships and other things. Um, I've done some out of program um, doing uh, a chief registrar program as part of uh, the Royal College of Physicians. So there's different things that you can do. Um, and then somebody else had asked in terms of then when you come back, can you sort of change from full time to less than full time? And I think particularly if you're keen on academic and you want to uh, keep some of your academic days, then you could perhaps come back less than full time uh, in clinical, but still work full time and do some academic days. So uh, there's different flexibilities in training as you go through. So hopefully that adds a little bit to that answer. Thank you. Classic, the classic question that we always get asked. <laughs> so, Tinder, do you want to have a do you want to have a, a yeah. talk about that one? Yeah, absolutely. So what is the difference between medical and clinical oncology? Can you apply to both? Um, so just to answer the can you apply for both? Yes, absolutely. You can apply for both. And um, in terms of medical and clinical oncology, we work very closely with our clinical oncology colleagues. So as medical oncologists, we are um, we look after the systemic therapy side of a patient's treatment and management. And uh, we also are, are, the, are the first people to bring in some of the newer therapies as well in terms of um, initiating drugs that are that are that are coming out of clinical trials and also um, and running clinical trials of systemic therapy. So we're very much focused on um, those um, new agents that are coming through targeting different cancer mechanisms and um, looking at different ways that we can use those to, to control or cure cancer. Clinical oncologists also use systemic therapy, but their focus is, is on radiotherapy treatments. So, um, so and, and that is to, to varying degrees. There are some um, clinical oncologists in some tumor types, for example, breast cancer, where they will have a systemic therapy element and um, radiotherapy element. And there are some uh, at the other end of the spectrum, for example, head and neck cancer, where they there will be lots of technical radiotherapy, lots of very complex planning that they will be doing. So so um, that that's the main difference between um, medical and clinical oncology and the and the training pathway we have a common stem for so we we recognize that actually there is quite a lot of overlap in what we do so that first year covers that those those common elements and then the the training splits apart and um, and we follow our curriculum the clinical oncologists follow theirs and their training is slightly longer it's interesting go on Ella you're going to uh, you're going to make yeah just, just to add to that, that we've, yeah. had a, we've had a question about what to do if you want to switch um so my understanding is that if you do the oncology common stem year, it's called a common stem year. Say you started as ClinOnc and you wanted to change to MedOnc, um, you do have to reapply nationally through the national recruitment system. However, if you've completed that oncology common stem ST3 year, you can enter the alternate alternative training at ST4 level because you've already done the common year. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it's spot on. We've actually had the first people doing that it, uh, probably across all of our deaneries, and uh, it, it's working reasonably well you just have the the fun of that second interview um there was another interesting question there's a couple in there about what can a medical oncologist do that a clinical oncologist cannot so the other way around um and, and sort of why we'd recommend medical oncology i i guess it's just to, to add to your answer a little bit um obviously not everyone has has their has the because the structure of medical or clinical oncology set up the way we do in the uk so on the one hand, it's a huge strength that we all work together and it probably tracks back, doesn't it, to where we used to have far fewer medical oncologists, um, which comes to the point of, of why we're highlighting to you guys who are listening in that there's a huge opportunity to come and take part and be part of the speciality um, because we've been we've, we've been growing and the, we need more people to look after patients with cancer. Um, and actually, there's a sort of rebalancing and and we we do focus on those systemic treatment um elements we have a strong foothold in clinical trials not that other people do not and then you also got to think about your your comment on your slide about 
who are your people and, and, and what makes you tick. And I think we all need to look at where we might be in five, 10 years or where the specialities will be and, and what our patients are going to need from us in, in terms of looking after them. Because actually things are moving really quite fast. Systemic treatments are evolving. Um, we've moved from chemotherapy to molecular targeted to immunotherapy we're just about keeping i don't think we've learned about the first one of those yet we're trying to keep up and now we're moving into cellular and, and uh more and more different types of therapy so i think the, the the differences may be hard for us to articulate we try and show that we're more common than different but i, I think the world in 10 20 years is going to keep evolving and, and it's a really great time to to define what your consultant post looks like because it's going to change and so i hope that helps answer some of the differences between us mm -hmm. Now, the, the less than full time. Um, so I, I wonder, I might throw that to you guys, because I'd like to say as a, from a training program director point of view, I, I, I would fully support as, as much as possible. And our doing are very helpful. But I'm, I'm curious to let you guys give you the experience on the ground and you've seen you in your slides. Um, so over, over to Hello, Jenny and Richard, if I may. Yeah, I can. I'm happy to, to talk about that. So um, I, I, as I said, I'm a less than full time trainee. I decided that just at the end of ST3. So I, I started as a full time trainee and and decided I wanted to go down to less than full time. Um, and certainly in Yorkshire, um, that was fairly easy. I spoke to my training director, um, gave, filled out all the requisite forms. Um, and there was certainly no pushback at all. So I, I had a really positive experience of being able to go less than full time. Um, and I know in, in certainly in Yorkshire, um, a lot of people, sorry, I'm just, um, a lot of people in Yorkshire do do less than full time training. Um, and I suspect probably in Bristol and Liverpool, it's much the same. Um, so I think nationally it's it's much more accepted now than perhaps it was a few years ago that that people do that for whatever reason. And, and that's actually often positive for them in terms of work-life balance and, and being able to get through their training. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, I think this uh, work-life balancing is certainly changed a lot since covid and i think uh, i certainly don't know anybody who has been declined uh when they've applied for less than full time um something i wanted to add in terms of uh, there was a question that came in in terms of if you're less than full time does it add time onto your training so in terms of the uh, curriculum and uh, your portfolio it is competency based rather than time based uh, however, if you or your training program director feel that uh, you need more time, um, then you can add time onto the end if you feel that you need it. Um, but uh, certainly it, it, going less than full time doesn't mean you need to make time up as such. Super. While we're moving on to the next question, I'm just quickly going to tidy up my answer to the question about paces. So the, the deadline for having full MRCP is the 23rd of October for the next round of our recruitment. So that's the pressing issue for us when we go into our second round of recruitment. And then we are back to pre-COVID rules. So just to clarify that one, thank you. Um, right. So I'm conscious that we are running slightly short of time. We had a few questions, so we'll try and rattle through some of these. Um, experience in oncology, I think we've covered, but we are asking you to show some commitment to speciality through the application. So we're not we're not expecting not everyone had the opportunity, but there is there are patients with cancer all around the hospital. So we'd be surprised if you weren't able to show an interest in the speciality in your application. And that's been a theme, I think, of questions. And there's some about uh, in the chat as well. I think we've probably covered that to some extent in the in the answer for the other one which is you know seek out anything to do with looking after patients with cancer in whatever speciality you're in and try and focus your projects your quality improvement teaching experience onto that because then that helps the um speciality and the commitment section so Tinder, i'm going to keep going on a roll if you don't mind um the number of training posts has changed in the last few years to give you some context um we've gone in the east of england from five ntn posts up to nearly 20. so everywhere outside of london there's been a large expansion in numbers i would predict and i don't know for sure but we we've had the expansion but now we'll have steady steady state as a minimum 
so they're you know people will complete their training and then we'll be appointing more people than we used to so again the message for today is um you know getting into the speciality is competitive and you know we'd like to point out we want you to come and join us but there are actually more jobs than there used to be and so there's lots of good opportunities to come and get into medical oncology so tinder i'm going to let you talk briefly because i'm talking a lot so um just on the is it possible that medical trainees would need to train or do general med in, in the future at the moment we are a group two specialty so we do not have to um, train in general internal medicine and uh, or, or do the the on call the uh, all curricula are going to be reviewed on a four four yearly basis so that's something that may come up for review in the future at the moment we you know we're, we're very much in in group two i think probably worth saying while we move the question on that i think any all of us uh, in the uh, consultant and the acp and, and everyone and patients feel very strongly that that we wouldn't want that to change in, in terms of the patient experience and the care we deliver so hopefully that wouldn't be something we change i am Conscious of time, and we've hit eight, um, quarter two, so thank you. We are going to draw a, a line here. Um, I know you've all been putting in questions, which is great. So we're going to try and answer those um, potentially through the ACP Twitter account. And we're going to um, put a come back to you guys um, post the meeting with um, some follow up and just a mail shot to summarise. This is the key thing we really wanted to show you. So round two applications for entering ST3 are open. We wanted to encourage you to think about applying if you're in the in the position to do so, because the, the deadline for applications is next week. Uh, and then we will send, send that follow up email with links and helpful information that we can do. And just really brilliant. Thank you to the, the, the over 100 of you who've dialed in on, a, on an evening to listen to us uh, go on. And hopefully uh, we've given you some insight into the speciality and, and encouragement to think about applying. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. I think we will call it to a close there. Thank you ever so much.